how do I get them to understand what I want them to understand? So they don't get frustrated with me and I don't get frustrated with them not understanding what I'm trying to tell you. So essentially it's an outcome. In either case, in a law enforcement perspective or coaching baseball perspective, you're trying to get something out of somebody that they don't maybe have Im the immediate skills or abilities to get to. San Diego 911 emergency. Oh, you need to come right away. There's a man with a gun and it's what loaded. What's the police? Fire. Fire. Receiving emergency signal from... 4 charge, 1141. We've got a white team available. We need paramedics uh, close for you. All available units will code that way. Welcome to the De-Escalation Conversations podcast, and I am honored to introduce you to a, a man who has become a friend of mine over the last few months, uh, several months. I can't even count how long it's been, but what's interesting is I knew him before I met him because I'd followed Doug Wiley for years because his articles absolutely fascinated me. The way he writes, the way he's able to express ideas, convey perspective. There's rarely a writer that I have enjoyed as much as I have reading Doug Wiley's work. He's authored thousands of feature articles, opinion columns, news reports, and tactical tips, all with the goal of ensuring that police officers are safer and more successful on the streets. He is a Western Publishing Association Maggie Award winner for best regularly I have a hard time saying that word, featured digital edition column. He's a member of the International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association, ILEDA, which by the way, their conference is coming up in March. It's March of every year in St. Louis. And if, you haven't, if you're a trainer and you haven't heard about ILEDA, you and I need to talk. He's also an associate member of the California Peace Officers Association, CPOA, and a member of the Public Safety Writers Association, PSWA. Doug? Welcome to the show. Good to see you, Kerry. It is great to have you here. I'm honored that you're taking the time because I know you're an incredibly busy guy with your family and all the work that you do. I have no idea. You are a prolific, prolific writer. In fact, let me ask you this. There's one question I haven't asked you before in our many conversations and all the time we spent together talking. How did you get into this police writing thing? That's a, it's okay. That's a great question. There's a very long story. and I'll tell you the short version of it. I, at the time was living and working in San Francisco. I, at the time was in between journalism gigs. Now journalists tend to be, you know, we play a little bit on the, the good side, you know, and then the dark side, the dark side, of course, is public relations. And I, at the time was, this was now almost exactly 15 years. It was working at a public, a public relations agency with my then wife, who was the HR manager for the agency. She has a friend, had a friend then, still has that friend now, who emailed her saying, we have an opening for a job. It's editor of a website for law enforcement officers. We haven't been able to keep anybody in this job for any more than a couple months, a year at the outside. Do you know anybody who could do this job? So she emails me or forwards this note to me saying, do you know anybody? And I kind of wryly write back me because I had, of course, an obvious interest in journalism. I wanted to get back into the game of doing the writing, not for someone else's benefit, but for the reader's benefit, not for the benefit of the organization, the company you know, that I was flacking. But also I, I've been a pro cop person most of my life. I mean, really my dad's first, the first friend that I remember from my dad his best friend at the time was a law enforcement officer in, in New York. And I grew up north of New York City, but close enough to New York City that we knew all about what was going on in New York City. And my dad introduced me to this fellow. And so I knew this guy growing up and I was, you know, always around people on armed services, you know, retire, retired veterans from their various armed forces. I hung around the law, the law enforcement folks who were living in my town who worked in the city. And so it, it was a natural fit. And that job was, I, I was in that job for 10 years. You know, the, my predecessor was in the job for nine months. My predecessor before that was in the job for six months. My predecessor before that person was in the job for a year. So in the span of three years, they had four people and that fourth person, my, myself, I, I held that job for 10 years. I, it was just a natural fit for me. I moved on from, that was policeone.com. And I moved on from police one to doing a little bit of consulting to, for various organizations. 
agencies and companies to do their communications work and then fell into working with Police Magazine, which is now I've had that job for five years. So it's just a natural fit for me. Very, very cool. And and your title (laughs) cracked me up all the time. Language architect and freelance writer. Tell me about this language architect thing. So I've joked for years. Now, my first journalism job wasn't even a journalism job. I actually worked for the State Department back in the first Gulf War. And as part of that, it wasn't even journalism, but it was, re- it was basically a report. It was taking source materials. Some of that was classified. Some of that was open source. So I had a classified clearance. And I can't even really talk too much about the job itself, but essentially I took these materials and I condensed very, very large volumes of information into digestible nuggets that were read by people in the White House, people in Congress, people in various agencies, because we were ramping up for the Gulf, the first one. And at the time, I kind of was thinking, well, what I'm basically doing is taking this giant forest of stuff and making a small little cabin of information out of it. So I'm chopping down the trees and I'm milling the wood and I'm turning it into plywood and turning it into lumber and assembling the thing into something that is usable by some human someplace because it's a literally forest for the tree situation when you have all of that information and it has to be findable, it has to be usable, it has to be digestible by people who have no idea who these players in the Middle East are. They know the name Saddam and they know, you know, various other people that are high level, but they didn't know the the really the on the ground stuff. So that's how I became a, a journalist. And that's how I became a language architect. I was turning huge amounts of volume, volumes of information and turning it into useful, digestible, small 2000, 5000 word documents. Well, it, as you talk about that, where you're taking all this information, and you're just your forest for the trees, allowing people to see the forest and not just the trees, all of this information and condensing it down. uh, That is, I don't know if that's where you develop the skills or as a natural innate ability, but what I've noticed in your writing is you have a a great ability to get the point across in not that many words. And that's fascinating to me simply because I know and our, our readers will probably pick up on it very quickly because they're incredibly smart people. You are incredibly smart. You, your vocabulary, your educational level, your ability to, to converse on any level. You could walk into a room full of PhD professors at, at any, any university and hold your own without the, and they would just think you're a professor. I mean, you even got the vest on and the, and the, and the, and the, the, the coat. Because you know, cool. would would fit right. You are cool. You're a cool guy. And what I love is you and I can sit down in a Starbucks with your son and just shoot the breeze and 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 converse at a fourth grade level communication level that I communicate at. And and yet you can knock the socks off anybody else. So I just want to compliment you on that. And if our readers don't pick up on that, well, they will now. So. I, like I say, I don't know where you develop that ability to write as well as you do and to be able to take these complex thoughts and be able to break them down. It's, it's pretty fascinating. So let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit and let's get into the complex world of de-escalation. And what is, when you hear the term de-escalation, what is the, the lens that you look at that term through? Because I want to make sure that you and me and our readers are all on the same page. I'm just Curious when you think about de-escalation, that term, what do you what do you view that as? Mostly I see and hear that word as an outcome and not as a strategy or a tactic. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saying that. Yes. I Sorry. see de-escalation <laughs> as a it's a desired state in which if anything bad is happening, it's at least mitigated or it's minimized. Or you're able to process it in such a way that you are not going to make it worse, right? So, so non-escalation. In, it's essentially non-escalation, yes. So you're going to, if you, let's say from a law enforcement officer's perspective, you're walking up to fill in the blank, whatever it is, DV, whatever traffic stop, whatever call it is, 
the outcome is you want to make it not just better. I mean, that would be the best thing, right? But you just don't want to make the situation worse. First and foremost, do no harm, right? But you've got to have an outcome that is, say, someone hooked up in handcuffs or someone, you know, giving to you something that they you, you want that they didn't necessarily want to give to you. The pipe they're holding, information that they have. That, you know, so you want something from this transaction, and I hate using that word, but it is. It's ultimately somewhat transactional. You are getting something, they are getting something. And they might not like what they're getting, but they're getting something, right? So you're entering into this kind of relationship, very temporary, but a relationship nonetheless, where you are seeking an outcome that is hopefully nonviolent, hopefully essentially that has everyone not happy at the end of the day, but with what it is that they deserve. Frankly, if it's them being arrested or just getting some information from that person in an interview or in a not in a, even a custodial setting, you really just want that not to go boom, right? So I look at it from the perspective of understanding the person that you're approaching, understanding yourself and how you're approaching them, using skill, using language that matches what they're trying to figure out. Like they they know you're okay. Let's say you're not a cop. Let's say you're a coach. Right. Let's say in the example that you're, you're, I was a baseball coach for a long time. I want someone to get their level. I want them to swing level. I want them to understand how to, how to do that. I have to think in the head of a 10 year old, how do I explain that mechanic to them that I get what I want and they get what they want. They get to put the bat on the ball. They get to proceed to first base because of a, you know, a, an infield hit. How do I get them to understand what I want them to understand? So they don't get frustrated with me and I don't get frustrated with them not understanding what I'm trying to tell you. So essentially it's an outcome. In either case, in a law enforcement perspective or coaching baseball perspective, you're trying to get something out of somebody that they don't maybe have Im the immediate skills or abilities to get to. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of our listeners are, are school teachers and, okay. and, and medical service providers are in, in people's homes. So they're not, they're not a cop. And so that analogy that you used of a, of a coach being able to get into the head of a 10 year old, which is by the way, why you communicate with me so well, because that's the same technique, but the, being able to get into the other person's head and have influence, be able to persuade people who don't want to be persuaded. That's yeah. the exact stuff that, that, that we teach how to do at idea. And at the same time, that's, that's beautiful. And we, we, the other thing I just want to throw out is while we're on the topic of de-escalation, not that it's not the entire episode, but it's co-created. And sometimes we don't have control over what the other person does. But then the question I feel becomes, can we have influence? We can't control what they do, but can we have influence? Can we persuade them by whatever means, getting in their head, flipping that switch, then they don't even realize that we talk about in our training that I think is, is an important factor. And that's a, in essence, what you, you spoke to. So thank you for that. I appreciate yeah, I that. Part of that is verbal coercion, you know, and you know, you have to essentially, I mean, you're selling an idea like cops talk people into handcuffs all the time. I mean, the vast majority of people who wind up in handcuffs are in handcuffs because they volunteered to get there. Like ultimately now they might not have wanted to from the jump, but Ultimately, that's where they wind up. And it's, it's, they might take a circuitous path. There might be on the ground scuffle. There might be a weapon come out of a holster and, and the threat of, you know, force. But I need you to get on the ground. I need you to put your hands interlaced behind your head. You know, there might be some escalation in the way in which you communicate the need for that person to do what you need them to do. But ultimately, you've talked them into the cuffs, right? You're not wrestling their arms together, physically putting them. It happens in the TV shows all the time, but that's not the way it always goes down on the street. So there has to be some level of buy-in from the person that you're trying to get something from. And that requires that you, 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 you talk to them at least at some level on their level, right? You have yeah. to tell them the most beneficial, the most beneficial thing for you right now is for you to get in these handcuffs. The most beneficial for, thing for you right now in hospice care is for you to be 
come and 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 and, and enjoy these moments that you have with your family. The most or, beneficial or to the family or to the family. The most beneficial thing is let me take care of grandpa. Right. Exactly. Let me let me take care of what I need to do, that kind of thing. And so often you need to to sell the idea on in in a way that that they want to buy the car that you're selling. Right. That they go, oh yeah, that's a really good car. I want I didn't walk in here thinking I was going to buy that car, but yeah, I'm buying that car right now. But you have to kind of, you have to talk them into something. And, and it's interesting because a lot of people who are in sales, not just leadership and management, but not even remotely related to first responders have sought us out because of how effective our tools are for persuasion and influence. They work yeah. great in sales too, because that's what we're, everything is a sale. You're getting your son to, to take a shower and go to bed on, on, and on your timeline, not his. You're, you're getting him to do his homework. You're getting him to eat his veggies or, or home, do his homework, whatever it is. Everything is a sale. So using sales techniques and a lot of the tools that, that, that we use, some of them like bank code that you and I have talked about was initially designed as a sales training system. It just happens to work amazingly well for de-escalation and, and for communication skills. So there's, there's definitely some sales work in there. No doubt. It's funny because we, you talk about bank code. I don't know if it was inherent or some experiential thing, but some of what bank code and you taught me specifically with regards to bank code, um, it's kind of, you got to know your audience, got to read the room. I've always said, read the room and you got to know who you're talking with. And so I, it somehow inherently, I have the interest or motivation to want to think about the person with whom I'm talking as I'm talking with them and not, you know, I'm not going to treat this person exactly the same as that person. I will treat them equally well, but I won't treat them equally, if that makes any sense, because it, what works for this individual is not necessarily going to work for that individual. And you have to tailor your, tailor your interaction with them appropriately and, 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 and sufficiently with sufficient skill that you're going to be able to express what you want to, to this person in a manner that they want to hear it and then have to deal with the same talk with that next person. Again, I go back to coaching. You, 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 you are going to deal with the lineman. And you're going to deal with the quarterback. They have extraordinarily different responsibilities, but it's your responsibility to make sure they both work together in synchronicity in order for that situation to work. Times 11, times 22, times all the guys who are on the special teams, times all the guys who are on second string. So you're dealing with all of those moving parts equally well and with equal measures of respect, but you have to do it in di totally different ways because defense is different from offense. Special teams is different from all of the others. And each individual on all those teams is going to be responsive to a different manner of construction. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And the, the, the phrase we use is speaking in a language that the other person can best hear. Yeah. Because when you do that, not, not speaking your primary language, but their primary language. Because when you can do that, then they can hear you and you can have effective communication. You can actually achieve what you want to achieve in that transactional encounter and and if they get what they want to whatever degree is appropriate then that's great too and most of the time what people want is just to be treated with dignity and respect and and the other thing i'll say before we shift gears is all of us have an addiction every single human being on this planet has an addiction and that addiction is to be understood and when you can speak in the language that the other person can best hear, they're going to feel understood. And yep. when you can satisfy that addiction, you, you can get your boy to do his homework. Yeah. I'm still yeah. trying to figure that one out. But. Uh, we'll keep talking. All right. So let, let me shift gears from yep. homework to, well, we got to talk about Memphis. Yep. And... Let's talk about Memphis in kind of a framework of, I talk about the post-pursuit use of force trap. Yeah. And we, we've seen this, gosh, 
You know, I spent 30 years as a cop and it was happening before I became a cop. Why? And, and you talk to people from all walks of life. You talk to law enforcement officers internationally. What are your thoughts on why cops get caught up in this post -pers post pursuit use of force trap? That I I don't really know. My theory is that there is a cops are generally speaking very goal oriented. First off, very type A, and, and that's that's a rule of thumb. There are exceptions to everything. But goal oriented, and if the goal is the apprehension and arrest of an individual who is fleeing police, who would be fleeing for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is they did something wrong and they know it, and they don't want to go to jail, or they're afraid for their life from the police, right? They're, they're afraid that they're going to get harmed by the police. Turns out sometimes they're right, partially because of this post pursuit. It, I would call it a fever more than anything else. It's this feverish desire for an outcome of putting somebody into custody. And in many cases, when you have a fleeing felon, a dangerous person who poses a clear and present danger, if they were to ex escape, right? There's, there's a reason why you want to put that person into handcuffs and that person into custody and away from civil society, at least until you can ameliorate whatever problem they're in. Whether it's crazy on drugs, whether that's psychotic episode, or whether that's just a person who's prone to violence and needs to be locked away. So there's an outcome that you're looking for. And, and I believe it, that, it, that that outcome becomes that you almost get tunnel visioned into it and you fail to see the other circumstances around you where you fail to see the other possible avenues to achieve that objective. It's kind of the, the, the dog chasing after the mechanical bunny, you know, it's just the bunny. All you're thinking about is the bunny, but you're not thinking about maybe what if, what if I didn't chase the bunny? If I just waited here while the bunny rounds the tree and comes right back to me, you know? So it's, it's a failure. I think, and not, I hate using the word failure, but it's, it's a decision at times to continue doing a thing that you've already started. You got sunk cost, you know, I'm sunk cost in the pursuit. I'm sunk cost in, I've torn my uniform. I've wrecked the car. I've done all these things. I got to get that guy. I got to get him. Like he wrecked a car. <laughs> you know, my uniform's trashed. You know, I'm on video on three different surveillance cameras running this guy, right? I want him. That you fail to see or, or decide to not see that there is another way to do it. And that's whether it's a failure or, or it's a decision, I think it's one case to the next. In Memphis, I think that's a unique, a unique case. I think that there is an element to that post pursuit fever or use of force trap that you call it. I think that there's underlying issues in Memphis that are extraordinary and beyond that one specific element. I think there are hiring problems. I think there are training problems. I think there are problems with regard to the culture of that unit. I think there are problems with regard to the culture of that agency. I think that that thing, there's a lot of shared blame in that particular use of force that tragic death of that individual that was preventable, that it's not just a post-pursuit, you know, fever or that desired outcome of putting that guy in cuffs. Because that, there was more going on there than just, we got to get him arrested. Yeah, and I think that gets, that point does get lost. It's like a 1500 piece picture puzzle. Yeah. There's lots of little pieces you know, I was working on a puzzle just last night and there was a, there was two pieces that were a border piece and they were the last ones and they had to fit together, but they were, they're just a little bit off. And ironically enough on the exact opposite side at the bottom of the puzzle, this was at the top at the bottom of the puzzle lined up on the crack of the table where the leaves come together was this same thing it probably was a defect there's not two pieces missing but i was searching all over i was searching under furniture had my flashlight out looking all over for a missing piece until we figured out well made it wait a second maybe it's actually a manufacturing defect maybe there's something else here than what meets the eye mm -hmm. but that 
the, the junction of those two pieces, when you look at it, affects the entire puzzle. And, and there's more to it than just those two pieces, though. And so uh, as you listed off thing after thing after thing after thing that may have contributed, the one thing I, I want to say and I want to be really clear about, we are not Monday morning quarterbacking what happened in Memphis. What we are doing, though, is we're watching the game film because there is not a pro athlete out there, win or lose, that doesn't watch the game film and go, okay, what do I need to do differently next time? What do I need to improve on? What can I do better? Where, where did I make a mistake? Whether it was in judgment or instinct or, or training, performance, how can I improve? And that's, I, I wanna be really clear to our listeners, we have to do that as law enforcement. And that is different than what a mainstream media might do with Monday morning quarterback and where it's nothing about improvement, it's just about placing blame. So when we have these discussions about Memphis or about, let's go back all the way to Ferguson, anytime we look at that, that's always the lens that, that we examine things with is how do we do things better? And, and, and it, how do we save officers' lives? We've done that for, well, not long enough, but we've done that for a really long time. When we talk about, you know, I've got up here on my, on my bookcase, Tactics for Criminal Patrol. You got it right there. You know, the trilogy for street survival. And, and, oh, and, right. and, 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 and the man ahead of his time. Oh, a hundred percent. And, and so as we look at these things, you know, the, the top 10 deadly mistakes, that's not Monday morning quarterback. And that is watching the game film. So I just wanted to throw that out there while we, while we talk about these things. So let me, let me dovetail yeah. onto that too. Um, yeah, please. About two and a half weeks after the Wright brothers invented the thing, I used to fly airplanes and I didn't do it for very long and I wasn't particularly great at it, but I really enjoyed the learning process. And I really enjoyed knowing that it's a, it's a, it's a, first off, it's a fungible skill. And it's one, that even if you're really, really good at it, you can always get better at it. And the people who are really, really good at it are constantly working to get better. And they're doing so by reading NTSB reports. These are terribly boring reports most of the time. It's like reading autopsies or police reports. It's not entertaining reading. However, gleaned from in those documents is information about either pilot error or weather incident or mechanical error. There's lessons learned about, well, let's see, how, how do I not do what he did? In Flying Magazine, to which I was a subscriber for years when I was thinking I was going to be a pilot for a living, there is a segment, a piece that appears in that magazine every month called, I learned about flying from that, dot, dot, dot. And it's some person's experience that one, they live, first off, they live through it to be able to write about it and tell them. It. So this is an incident that was fixable somehow, right? They fixed it. And, or they figured out a way to survive in a, a potentially deadly incident. They figured out a way to live through it. And it's lessons learned from stuff that went sideways, that went wildly sideways, whether it was their own fault or the fault of the weather or a mechanical issue, they figured something out. And so this is the same thing as when we look at when Chuck Ramsberg and, and Denny Anderson were going on the road, what was that, the early 80s? with the little reels of videotape that was actually 18 or 20 millimeter film or what have you. Back in the old school days when they didn't have slides, they actually had overhead projectors with the translucent or, or transparent paper that you put on there. Gordon Graham style. Yeah, exactly. So they were doing essentially the same thing as the, I learned about flying from that or Monday morning watching the game film as you would in the NFL or college, whatever level of football you're playing. You're looking at stuff that has gone well and has gone not as well. And you're figuring out ways to get better. Like I said, the best pilots in the world, the people that I really wanted, I aspired to be like, they were constantly looking at even their own landings. You know, you look at guys in the Navy who are landing on postage stamps, essentially. And they're constantly looking at which wire they're hitting. So there, it's, it's not a matter of how did, the, how did this go so poorly? It's like, I did that really, really well, but I want to do it better next time. 
because there no no carrier land, no two carrier landings are alike. And I don't remember who said it, but no man steps in the same stream twice because it's not the same stream and it's not the same same man the time you take it the second step. So that's how I look at this. Things like Memphis lessons learned from that that can be organizational, that can be from from a training perspective, that could be from understanding outcomes from hiring practices that might have led to that issue. But you have to look at it and go, all right, what do we have and how do we analyze that from an objective standpoint? Not a not this not a subjective, I want this storyline or I, I want this particular narrative to be played out. I want to just look at it from a almost a scientific perspective and say, what do we have and how do we figure out that it doesn't happen like that again? Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Doug, I I'm gonna have to have you back because we're out of time, brother. And I could you know what? I'm gonna be seeing you at, at the ILEDA conference in St. Louis in March. It's March of every year, it's right around St. Patrick's Day. Again, if you haven't heard of Ilita, this is they're not paying me to say this. I just love the organization. I've been a member for years. Gosh, for like with the exception of when they were off one year for COVID, I've presented every single year. I'm actually doing, I'm teaching four different times this year. So check out ILEDA.org if you haven't. It'll be in the show notes. Doug, the way for people to get a hold of you is going to be in the show notes. If you're driving, listening to this, you're not going to write it down anyway. Look in the show notes. If you're on YouTube watching it, just scroll down Facebook, scroll down, look in the comments. By the way, while you're there, hit that like, subscribe, hit that little darn bell thing to get notified whenever a new episode drops de-escalation conversations has a new episode every monday morning at 6 a.m pacific so come back make sure you check out for when doug is back the next time plus the other amazing people that we're honored to have doug thanks for being here appreciate your time and appreciate your insights they are as always profound thank you Kerry. thank you listeners as always until next time Please stay safe.